Hello. I still remember the very first time I ever said that word, holding a telephone. I grew up in a very small remote forest in South India. You know, the kind with no running water, just me and monkeys running around. And as a child, one of my favorite things was to hold a telephone and talk on it. But for me to do that, my parents would have to put me in a bus and make a 100-kilometer trip. Technology still hadn't gotten that far yet. One day, it was in December of 2004. It was just the day after Christmas. I was 15 years old, and I woke up to the news of what would become the deadliest disasters of recorded human history. The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami hit the eastern coast of India, not too far from my little forest, with several other countries nearby. It took the lives of over 200,000 people and left millions homeless. All that happened just in a few hours. At that time, part of my father's job was go through coastal villages and assess the activities of the fishermen community. And for the very first time when I went with him, I saw what disasters could leave behind. It was destruction beyond my imagination. As I was walking through this small village, there was an old grandfather pointing at a mass grave, and he said, we had to bury hundreds of people together because we didn't have enough time to dig individual graves. When the first wave hit, he said, news about these majestic waves, waves as tall as coconut trees, spread so fast, faster than the waves themselves, that people woke up and ran towards the ocean to witness this mystery. And the second wave, which was more forceful, took more lives with it. As an angry teenager, I asked my father why no one did anything about this. Why did this happen? And he simply replied, kiddo, ask what you can do if this happens again. And there I was, a teenage girl who was growing up with monkeys in a forest, listening to stories about how it was nature's wrath that took people's lives. And I certainly didn't think anything could be done. It was, after all, a natural disaster. But a couple of years later, when I had to pick major for my college, for the first time, I heard about this thing called geomatics. Now, geomatics is the study of collecting data about our planet. It could be any data, temperature, rainfall, vegetation, how high the mountains are, pretty much any data that we can collect. And the science of processing and analyzing this data into useful information. Now, the more we collect, the more we can process, and the more we can understand about what's going on around us. So I thought maybe this is something I could do. Maybe this is the way I can understand nature's wrath. And 10 years later, today, I work with UNITAR in their program called UNOSAT, where I do just that. We collect as much data as we can, and we process them as fast as we can, so we can get the information into the hands of the people who need it the most. When you look at this globe, there is not a single place we can point to and say, this is free from natural or man-made hazard. Disasters happen everywhere. In fact, in the last two decades, disasters have doubled in numbers. Satellite data helps us to visualize and respond in a way it was not possible before. For instance, let's look at floods. 
one of the most occurring natural hazards on this planet. In Thailand, during 2011 floods, satellite mapping showed us the complete extent of the flooded region, which we couldn't see it from the ground. We have satellites that can see through clouds or even during nights. Or forest fires, we can see fire hotspots from space. We can visualize them over space as well as time. We are also monitoring conflicts. By the end of 2015, there were well over 4 million Syrian refugees. This is Al-Zadari refugee camp in Jordan. This camp grew in a way no one could have imagined, from almost nothing. Satellite data helps us to study the camp's growth, which becomes important planning tool. This is crucial information which cannot be obtained from the ground. We are also looking at cultural heritage sites. This is the Temple of Bel in the ancient city of Palmyra in Syria. It just disappeared from one day to the next. Apart from all the conflicts we study, we are also monitoring cows. In South Sudan, during conflicts, when people leave everything behind, they will not leave their cows behind. It's by finding these cows, we can actually see where the people are. So we can let the emergency responders on the ground know where help might be needed. So as you can see, disasters happen everywhere. But if you live in a developed world, you might not feel it the same way someone does in the developing world. For instance, let me show you an example of what happened during the 2010 Haiti earthquake. This is a heat map which shows the destruction to the buildings in the capital city. Even the presidential palace was damaged. Yet the following month, a more powerful earthquake hit Chile in South America. It released 500 times more energy than the Haitian one. Chile lost 700 of its citizens. When compared to over 150,000 Haitians who died the month ago, of course, there were some geological differences between these quakes, but Chile, as a country with long-standing history of earthquakes, was far better prepared. They have stronger building regulations in place. Even if we go back and look at the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, it took two hours to go from Indonesia to India. At that time, we had no way to warn the people. The killer here was not the tsunami in itself. It was not nature's wrath. It was lack of information, lack of an early warning system to let the people know, do not run towards the ocean, run away from it. As we look closely on again and again, there is nothing natural about any of these disasters. Natural hazards do not become disasters unless or until people are affected by it. And in most cases, these are the poor people who live in the most vulnerable settings with no preparedness. Poverty and inequality plays a role. Development of a country is directly linked to the impact of any disaster. Other than developmental issues, we also live in a world with major challenges our population is swelling, and it's going to cap at around 9 billion by 2050. 70% of that population is going to be concentrated in an urban area, which increases their vulnerability. When coupled with fast-moving effects of climate change, natural hazards will not only increase in numbers, but they will intensify. So, Instead of using the technology only to respond, it is more and more important to use the technology we have to better prepare, to understand the risks around us. We call this disaster risk 
reduction. For example, we know that 80% of Bangladesh is in a flood plain. We know that. If flood happens year after year, you may wonder why people still live there. Because flood plains are the source of some of the most fertile soil, so people will move back there to farm. But what if, what if we can tell a poor farmer in Bangladesh that there will be a flood a week before that happens so he can prepare, so he can anticipate? And we can. We can run flood models, which will show us where the river will flow and when the flood will happen. But the real question is, how can we get this information into the hands of the farmer who needs it the most? Unfortunately, in today's world, there are very few bridges between the technology we have and the local governments and the governments communicating to their people. What we urgently need to do is to close this gap. And that's exactly what we are addressing right now. We train local government officials on the free technology that we have, which could be used for their communities to prepare better, to face a natural hazard, and to know what to do. In today's world, the problem is not the lack of technology. It's the lack of awareness of what technology we have. Our actions today will determine if we are going to be more vulnerable or more resilient to them. If we want to prevent natural hazards from turning into fatal disasters, we all need to work together. We need to make the right choices at the community level. And the good news here is we can. We totally can do this together. When I was a kid, saying hello on a phone was a big deal. Not anymore. Today, even a girl from a remote forest can be part of this whole world's project to reduce the effects of disasters. Thank you.